Okay, this may be an announcement about Hillary Taylor. We will have a couple more announcements at the end of class about how we want to ensure students can interact with each other outside, number one, our regular class hours, and number two, to make sure that folks on Zoom can still participate in a post-class chat. We'll talk about that at the end of class this evening. Yes. Is there another uh, sign-in sheet? This one is already full. Hmm. Candy. Yeah, we can make one. You shall make another sign sheet right here. We'll just do it on the back. Okay. Just on the back. I don't know. We'll do it on the back. All right. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get class started first by talking a bit about my weekend. Um, some of you may know this. Most of you probably don't. But one of the other hats that I wear is I am the president of the African American Intellectual History Society, I'm an organization that's been around for about 10 years now. And just as we we had an annual conference. Uh, it was in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I was also conference chair. Um, so I am both the most tired person in the world and also the most relieved person in the world <laughs> because that conference is now over. Um, but at the conference, uh, we had a topic of discussion which ties into our class. The discussion topic was reparations, past, present, and future. And we we're talking about reparations both in the sense of historians, looking at it historically speaking, and also the idea of reparations as it relates to community involvement and engagement. And at the conference, I did have the pleasure of interviewing for our keynote address, uh, this gentleman, uh, Tana Hussey Copes, uh, who was the writer of the essay, The Case of Reparations in the Atlantic Magazine in 2014. And he shared his thoughts, thoughts about reparations since then, uh, talked about his current work, talked also a bit about Palestine as well, uh, in case you don't know, he actually visited the West Bank about a year and a half ago, uh, before uh, the recent war began, and that has profoundly shaped his thoughts about Palestine um, today. Um, in fact, he said at the conference that one of the things visiting Palestine taught him was the abject misery in which folks can live, but also the hope and the strength they can show despite those issues. He actually said one of the most delicious meals he's ever had in his entire life was with a Palestinian family in the West Bank. Despite them being poor, not having much, they gave him everything they could, and he appreciated that. Um, so that was uh, my weekend in a nutshell, um, and I am glad to be back in South Carolina. Um, but the conference and yesterday's deeper dive discussion with Justine Hill Edwards were also reminders of how all these topics about slavery, this, uh, this possession of land and so forth, how they still influence and impact folks across America and around the world, even in 2024. Um, on a personal note, I'm also pleased to say that I met Justine Hill Edwards for the first time in person at the conference as well. Uh, thanks to the Majestic School, we've known each other for years virtually, but that was our first in-person uh, meeting, which was fantastic. Okay, so, we did, of course, have a deeper dive discussion yesterday. Uh, thanks, Dr. Justine Hill Edwards. And I'm going to swing back from the topic she discussed about slavery and capitalism in South Carolina. But today's class is all about the founding of the Carolina colony, the rise of the Goose Creek men, and how South Carolina itself profoundly shaped the course of the Revolutionary War. Okay, so. Let's go ahead and get right into it. And again, as was the case last week, and it's the case every week, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them at the end of our conversation this evening. Now, when I first began teaching the Majestica Simpkins School of Human Rights, uh, one of the things that Brett always talked about was the Goose Creek Men. Um, he is, oh, for years, uh, we've talked about the Goose Creek Men and their importance to the history of the state and really to the history of British North America in general. And I think a lot of folks hear this phrase, Goose Creek Men, and may not have any idea of what that means. Well, if you don't know what it means and you want to know, you are in the right place. <laughs> Now, our story actually begins in Barbados. And again, this was brought up last week in class one. 
and yesterday afternoon in our deeper dive discussion as well. <clears throat> you really cannot know anything about the history of South Carolina without acknowledging first the history of the settlement of Barbados for that. Now, South Carolina colony as we know it was of course settled by the English in 1670. But the decades before that, English settlers in Barbados and Bermuda have been thinking for a long time about how to expand their hope, especially in relations as it relates to slavery and the acquisition of more land. Um, many of the folks living on Barbados in the 17th century were making an incredible fortune off of enslaved Africans. However, to continue to do this, they realized they A, needed more land to, on which to grow more crops, and B, they also needed a place from which to derive valuable foodstuffs as well. Again, Barbados is an incredibly small island. Most of the arable land was being used to grow cash crops. There wasn't much left over to feed the enslavers and the enslaved. And so the English eyed the North American mainland with a lot of envy and hope that they could expand their holdings there as well. Now, as we already know from last week's class, there were attempts by the Spanish to settle what is now South Carolina in the 16th century. Later on, the French also tried to do so as well. But there wasn't really a permanent European settlement until the English arrived by about 1670. And this really gives you the original borders of what becomes known first as Carolina colony, and by the early 18th century, the colonies of North and South Carolina. Now, it's worth noting, of course, as is the case with many maps from the 17th and early 18th centuries, the English are claiming a bit more land than they will actually be able to own. Um, you can see here, for example, that this territory in North Florida actually belonged, belonged in parenthesis quotation marks, to the Spanish. Um, and the area that is now Georgia, while the English had some claim on it, the English and the Spanish both saw the area known as Georgia really as a buffer zone between their two colonies. One thing we don't want to forget in tonight's conversation is that as much as this is a story about slavery and conquering of indigenous peoples, it is also a story of European exploitation and European imperial rivalry in North America and around the world. Now, when the English proprietors first began settling Carolina colony in the 1670s, the proprietors are quite clear on what they're trying to do with this colony. Out of all the British North American colonies, only South Carolina was founded with the expressed purpose of the expansion of slavery. You want to keep that in mind. While the other colonies do contain populations of enslaved Africans, only Carolina is founded for the purpose of expanding slavery and building off the slave trade itself. However, early on, the proprietors who were the folks who actually found the colony, they find themselves running into trouble with who they refer to as the Goose Creek men. These are individuals who moved from Barbados and other British colonies to settle down in Carolina colony to expand their holdings and enslavement and to also make more money. Now, you're probably thinking, well, aren't the proprietors and the Goose Creek men all trying to get the same thing? Yes and no. The proprietors and the Goose Creek men are both interested in making money. That much is certain. They can also agree on the exploitation of enslaved peoples, both those from Africa and indigenous peoples as well. But where they disagree is how to actually run the colony. Uh, the proprietors have a very hands-off policy. Uh, they are determined to not really interfere in the lives of colonists, but what that also means is that they've done or will do a very poor job of defending the colony in some upcoming wars in which Carolina will participate. The Goose Creek men, on the other hand, are very much invested in the idea of not only making more money in Carolina colony, but also trying to 
really expand the defense of the colony as well against both the Spanish and the indigenous peoples too. But the Goose Creek men will find ways to expand both their economic and political power, which will come into play in the early 18th century. Now, the funny thing about this, by the way, I, I cannot help but note is that in some sense, the first real political rivalry in South Carolina is between two groups of people who are both devoted to slavery. It's just a question of how to best defend that institution. And this again explains a great deal about South Carolina in the here and now. Now, the thing about the proprietors in the Goose Creek men is that while they had one eye on South Carolina, they had another eye on the East Coast of North America. And this was because understood like other colonists and settlers across the Americas, they were part of a huge European imperial rivalry. In the 17th and 18th centuries, there are numerous wars being fought in Europe amongst that continent's great powers. England, France, Spain, Portugal, the Dutch, so on and so forth. These conflicts, however, do not remain in Europe and oftentimes they spill over into open conflict in North America and the Caribbean as well. Now, this is going to impact South Carolina directly because these wars will often involve attacks on South Carolina as well. One example of this is Queen Anne's War, which was fought in the first two decades of the 18th century. Make a very, very long and complicated story short, Queen Anne's War was a war about who would succeed the, the deceased king of Spain. Um, however, that war in Europe turns into a war in North America, because as you can see here at the bottom of the map, um, while you have a colony in Carolina and a colony in Florida, one belongs to the Spanish, one to the English, the area between those two colonies was disputed territory. And there were attacks launched by the Spanish on Carolina itself during Queen Anne, Anne's War. The problem with this was that the Lord Proprietors did a poor job of defending the colony of South Carolina. Um, so poor, in fact, they really didn't defend the colony at all. Instead, the Goose Creek men take it upon themselves to defend the colony against Spanish attack. This is going to leave a sour taste in the mouths of many colonists in Carolina. Now, this is followed up a few years later with the Yamasee War, which we talked about briefly last week. And as we discussed last week, the Yamasee War comes very close to destroying Carolina colony. Uh, the Yamasee tribe and other allied tribes in what is now South Carolina and Georgia launch raids on Carolina colony. Again, as was the case in Queen Anne's War, with this conflict, the proprietors also failed to defend the colony. Um, instead, the colonists themselves really have to take up arms to defend themselves from attack by the indigenous peoples. Um, at the same time, uh, the British have a very hands-off policy with defense of the colonies. This is one of the reasons why the Goose Creek men are so mad at the proprietors. While these are reportedly English colonies, you have to keep in mind the way they're governed and ruled depends <laughs> on the colony itself. Uh, colonies funded by local proprietors were basically meant to be self-sustaining, self-sufficient, they were still primarily trading with England, of course, and had to abide by English common law. But otherwise, they were largely providing for their own defense. Um, this is going to cause some serious issues throughout the British colonies in the 17th and early 18th centuries. But the Goose Creek men will take matters into their own hands. Again, in the period from 1670 until about 1719, the primary conflict within Carolina colony, besides, of course, the, the obvious threat of a slave revolt, was the battle between the Goose Creek men on one side and the proprietors on the other side. Uh, by 1719, the Goose Creek men have acquired enough political power and acumen within Carolina colony to directly petition the British government in London for direct royal control of South Carolina. 
The idea is not to make South Carolina dependent on the British, not at all. The idea here is to at least give South Carolina more access to uh, assistance from the British in case of warfare, to give them access to more trade routes throughout the British Empire and so forth. The most important thing though, for the Goose Creek men, is to make sure the law proprietors are the ones who are no longer in charge. And by making South Carolina a royal colony, it means that the British government has some semblance of control over South Carolina, not full-scale control. Again, in the, the early 18th century, the British government is adamant about letting the colonies be as self-sufficient and self-governing as possible. Keep that in mind when we get to 1776, but I digress. By the way, this map here shows you what the colony looks like, like a better term, by 1760. And I use this map because it emphasizes another key fact about South Carolina. Today, of course, the state has settlers or residents from the coastline, through the Midlands, up to the border with Tennessee. But in the early to mid 18th century, most of the people, rather Europeans and Africans, you say that, who are living in South Carolina are living near the coastline. They're living either in the low country, as you see here, or kind of up near the PD up here as well. The areas you see in blue on this map are areas that are not settled by the English. I specify by the English. Those areas still have considerable uh, numbers of indigenous peoples living in them. But what's also worth noting is that much of this area that you see here, right, the area is now known as Congaree National Park. Um, much of that was basically viewed as a buffer zone between the English and the indigenous peoples to their north. So there aren't many English settlers or African slaves living beyond the low country, but as you can see, they are slowly starting to move further and further north and west as well. And also the dark lines on the map uh, show major roads and major routes for the colonists to use uh, in terms of transport of goods and services and people with colonies to their north as well. This map's gonna change very quickly in just a moment. Though. Now, as we've already discussed, one of the things that the Goose Creek men are also heavily invested in is slavery and the slave trade. And as we've already established, South Carolina is involved in not one, but two slave trades. One of indigenous peoples, especially the Amasi Indians, and secondly, those of Africans as well. Now, I mentioned the Yamasee War a moment ago. When the Yamasee are finally defeated by the Carolina colonists in 1718, many of the surviving Yamasee Indians are sold into slavery, and most of them are sent to die in the Caribbean via that slave trade. And while the English would maintain that they did not support this enslavement of indigenous peoples. This is a process that will continue throughout most of the 18th century and will become a bitter dividing line between the British on the one hand and the indigenous peoples in the South on the other. Also with this advertisement of African slaves, I want you to take a very close look at it for a second. Let me go ahead and read it. Now this advertisement is one you would have seen a newspaper um, in a slave holding area of the country throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. It says, to be sold on board the ship Batchelin on Tuesday the 6th of May next at Ashley Ferry, a choice cargo of about 100, oh, 250 fine healthy Negroes just arrived from the Windward and Rice Coast. The utmost care has already been taken and shall be continued to keep them free from the least danger of being infected with the smallpox. No boat having been on board, no boats having been on board, and all other communication with people from Charlestown prevented. Now, this advertisement points out a few important things about slavery in the 18th century in particular. The first thing 
is you should never, ever, ever think of the enslaved as unskilled labor. That is absolute nonsense. As you can see here, they point out where the enslaved were brought from, the Windward and Rice Coast. I wonder why someone in South Carolina want to purchase an enslaved person from a place called the Rice Coast. One of the major crops here at the time is rice. And they are making it quite clear that the enslaved they're bringing to South Carolina already have the know-how and knowledge that they need to become productive enslaved people. Again, you see this throughout the colonies in the Americas that the Europeans who are enslaving Africans are not seeing them as unskilled laborers, like automatons. They understand the knowledge that the enslaved bring with them from West Africa. If you want to see an example of this in the here and now, I just mentioned Congaree National Park. At Congaree National Park, there is a, a cattle mound in the middle of the park. The cattle mound was a place where you would push cattle to basically stand there during a flood. Now, this cattle mound that's in Congaree National Park, and I wish I had a photo of it to show you right now, but this cattle mound, we believe, was originally built by indigenous people who lived in South Carolina before Europeans here. Mm -hmm. But we also believe that cattle mound was also enhanced and built up by enslaved Africans, because we also know that in West Africa, there were areas of that part of the world that also had cattle mounds. Again, the technological know-how that the Africans brought with them to the Americas made the American colonies prosper. There was no other way to look at it. Secondly, though, with this advertisement, it talks about the danger of smallpox. South Carolina repeatedly had smallpox epidemics, other disease epidemics, and they're trying to make it clear that they're making sure the enslaved do not catch these diseases, these diseases either, trying to protect them because, again, these folks are an investment for the slave traders themselves. But throughout the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, newspapers across North America are showing advertisements like this one, showcasing the buying and selling of human beings. And that slavery system, I, I wanna briefly discuss how it becomes firmly ensconced within British North America. Now, of course, many of us have heard that the year 1619, the year in which um, the first enslaved Africans were brought to British North America in Virginia. Of course, as we all saw, you know, there were Africans in North America well before that, thanks to the Spanish, thanks to the French, thanks to other English missions into North America. But 1619 has always been a date of importance to Black Americans because of what it symbolizes more so than what actually happened on that particular day or year. It symbolizes the beginnings of the racialized system of slavery and the ideas of race that still dominate American discourse even today. In the first decades of African slavery in the British North American colonies, historians agree that the status of peoples of African descent was complicated. For example, in Virginia, we do know that in the 1620s and 30s, there were Africans who were able to purchase their freedom, purchase land, and even purchase other enslaved people to work for them. But over that same time period, ideas of race and racism are starting to form throughout the Atlantic world, in Europe and the Americas as well. And this question of racial identity is one that it is one that is very much part and parcel of the larger question of what what is the west what is this identity of the west of europe of the american so on and so forth and in british north america this really takes a dramatic turn in 1640 now, in Virginia, uh, there were three men who were indentured servants who escaped from their master's plantation. Two of them were of European parentage, and the other one was an African named John Punch. 
Now think about this for a second. These are three indentured servants, two white, one black. They agreed to try to escape from their server to by fleeing from Virginia into Maryland. But they were captured, brought back to Virginia for trial. And this is where things get very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now this big blob of a text on the screen is actually from the court's decision about the three men and their fate. Now, just read it out loud. Whereas Hugh Gwynn hath by order from this board brought back from Maryland, three servants formerly run away from the said Gwynn. So Hugh Gwynn was the master here. The court doth therefore order that the said three servants shall receive the punishment of whipping and have 30 stripes apiece. One called Victor, a Dutchman, the other a Scotchman called James Gregory shall first serve out their times with their master according to their indentures and one whole year apiece after the time of their service is expired by their said indentures and recompense of his loss sustained by their absence. And after that service to their said master is expired to serve the colony for three whole years apiece. So what that says is the two men, one the Dutchman, one Scotsman, they'll serve out the remainder of their actual servitude another year after that for punishment, and then three more years to the state of Virginia. Okay, so what about our good friend, John Punch? And that the third being a Negro named John Punch shall serve his said master or his assigned for the time of his natural life here or elsewhere. So again, the Scotchman and the Dutchman they have a few more years added to their service. John Punch, the rest of his life. So what you're already seeing here is how ideas of slavery don't pop up overnight, but they are built over time. And I also would say, I think one could also argue that this is as much an antecedent for the current state of mass incarceration as well, right? And racial disparities and prison punishment and the like. But these systems of slavery and racism, they are not born overnight. They take some time to become what we know them to be in the 18th and 19th centuries. And the case of John Punch is one such example of that. Now, by the end of the 17th century, you will see throughout the British colonies laws against interracial sex and marriage, for instance, which I always tell my students indicates that there must have been interracial sex and marriage leading up to that point. You also have situations like Bacon's Rebellion, which we mentioned briefly yesterday in Deeper Dive, where in Virginia in the 1670s, black and white laborers really unite under Nathaniel Bacon to rebel against the royal government. Now the rebellion is unsuccessful, but to the royal officials, the scariest part of the rebellion was black and white laborers joining forces. And after that, in Virginia and throughout the colonies, began to see stricter and stricter laws against the interaction between black and white laborers, for one, also stricter laws on the movement of the enslaved. And by the 1700s, you're seeing in the colonies an association between skin color and slavery built up not just by the slave trade, but also by the laws being put in place in these various colonies. The legal system in America is an example of how the law also shapes society, culture, and economics as well. And slavery was no different. Now, the colonies are becoming increasingly reliant on enslaved labor, and not just South Carolina either. Again, I mentioned Carolina because we're studying that for the Justice Simpkins School of Human Rights and because we live in South Carolina, but it's important to note the following thing. All those colonies you see on the map there, from uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire up north to Georgia down south, they all have enslaved populations. Yes, even Massachusetts, even New York. 
In fact, the two largest cities in terms of enslaved labor by about the 1730s and 40s um, were Charleston, number one, and number two was New York City. So slavery was very much throughout all 13 colonies, which is why many white colonists were often concerned about slave revolts. Um, going back to New York City for a second, New York would see a slave revolt in 1712, another one in 1740. Closer to home, of course, in South Carolina, we would have the Stono Rebellion of 1739. Now, I want to keep this map up for another brief moment because it actually helps to explain the Stono Rebellion story. I've already mentioned how the Spanish in Florida were seen as a constant threat to the British living in South Carolina and later on Georgia. In fact, one of the reasons for Georgia's founding in the 1730s was to serve as a buffer zone between South Carolina and Florida. And as a native Georgian, I find it to be pretty hilarious, but I digress. <laughs> However, this buffer zone was also fraught with issues as well, especially after the Spanish announced that any enslaved African who flees from South Carolina to Florida converse to Catholicism and agrees to take up arms against the English will be granted their freedom immediately and given a chance to settle in Spanish Florida. Now, were the Spanish racially egalitarians? No. Were the Spanish opposed to slavery? In the words of my students, hell no. But what the Spanish wanted to do was to hurt the English as much as possible. And they understood that because of South Carolina's dependence on slavery and its growing enslaved population, this could be a valuable tool to use against the English in South Carolina. Now, the Stono Rebellion actually takes place in September of 1739. And historians now believe that most of the rebels and rebel leaders were actually members of the Congo Kingdom, who I mentioned last week in class. We also believe that many of those rebels were actually soldiers in West Africa. This would actually explain how the rebels in the Stono Rebellion were initially so successful. We now know, based on eyewitness accounts of the rebellion and such, that they were very well organized, they had a plan of action and a plan of attack that they executed quite well during the rebellion's first few hours. Now, it's important to note that by the time the rebellion takes place, the colony of South Carolina is very much what we call a slave society. Amongst historians study slavery, there's an argument about what constitutes a slave society versus a society with slaves. A society with slaves is a place that has slavery, but it's not really important to the day-to-day -day life in that place. A slave society, on the other hand, is a place where everything, uh, the laws, the traditions, the customs, even the language, is shaped by slavery itself. And South Carolina is certainly an example of a slave society. For example, on Sundays, which was, you know, a day for most folks to go to church, they would make sure that folks were armed in the church because of the potential for a slave revolt. The white settlers of South Carolina were always fearful of a slave revolt. And in September of 1739, it finally happened. Now, the rebels at Stono they weren't trying to destroy the colony. They were actually trying to retreat from the colony toward Spanish Florida. That was their main objective. And for a while, it looked like they would actually make it. They were able to arm themselves. Uh, they killed several colonists. Um, however, the problem was that they were not quite able to move fast enough to evade the militia, uh, which was called out um, by the royal governor. This is an actual marker here in the state about the rebellion. Um, 
And the Stoner Rebellion itself was the largest insurrection in British North America. It's not, however, the only slave revolt we'll discuss in this course. There are quite a few coming up pretty soon, both today and next week as well. But Stono really shakes the foundations of slavery in South Carolina to the point where this, the royal government is going to have to think about how it can best suppress ideas of freedom amongst the enslaved. Now, I want to pause here for a second and go back to something that was asked about last week about historiography and slavery and the like. And it's important to note that for generations after emancipation, folks in this state and across the country were taught that enslaved Africans did not mind being enslaved. In fact, there was the myth of the happy slave. At the same time, most folks living in South Carolina in, say, I don't know, 1920 or 1945 or even the 1980s and 90s, hell, up until right now, don't didn't really learn much of anything about events like this that clearly give lie to the idea of the happy slave. In 1740, South Carolina's assembly passes the Negro Act of 1740. For one thing, it prohibits the teaching of reading and writing to enslaved Africans. It also makes it illegal for enslaved Africans to assemble in large groups or to raise their own food or money. Now, what's interesting is that yesterday's lecture by Justine Hill Edwards gets into how, despite this, you do still have slave Africans growing their own food, going to market, et cetera, but they are being very closely monitored in the process. The Negro Act would stay in effect until the end of the American Civil War, which means it survived the Revolutionary War, tons of upheaval across the United States, the antebellum period, and then through the Civil War itself. But it also shows just how dependent South Carolina had become on the institution of slavery. But they are taking steps to make sure another rebellion will never happen. Spoiler alert, uh, their efforts are not successful. Mm -hmm. So living in South Carolina, especially if you're a white settler, means you're likely pretty paranoid. You're paranoid about the potential for slave revolt. You're paranoid about the Spanish to your South. You're paranoid about the indigenous peoples as well. You have a deep-seated concern about the fate of your colony in the face of so many threats. And I think in, in some ways this shows us how South Carolina even now is shaped as much by fear as it is by anything else in its history. Fear of the enslaved, fear of the indigenous, fear of poor whites, fear of foreigners. The good news is that we don't have these problems today. <laughs> now, as I mentioned before, by the 1750s and 60s, you're going to see more uh, European settlers moving further inland, uh, out of low country, into the, mid the Midlands and the upstate as well. And this will happen primarily because um, British participation in major European wars overseas will once again spill over into wars in North America. And in fact, by 1763, at the end of the French and Indian War, you'll see more and more settlers moving further and further in, thanks to the elimination of the threat of the French, to an extent, the elimination of the threat of the Spanish as well. And this question of how slavery continues to influence the colony can be best summed up by the influence of its biggest and most important citizens, folks like Henry Lawrence, for example, who was an important citizen in South Carolina during the colonial period, 
uh, who becomes wealthy and important because of his investments in the slave trade. Uh, and I can assure you there are plenty of prominent South Carolinians who are making their money off of slavery and the slave trade who become prominent members of the state government, of the <clears throat> Continental Congress, and eventually the US Congress as well. In fact, you know, living in Columbia, uh, there are many streets here named after individuals from this time period most of not all of whom own enslaved people. Um, I mean, the buildings at USC are named after slave owners. Uh, for example, before, before I go on, I have to tell this quick story. So at the conference this past weekend, uh, I was talking to someone um, who was intrigued by the history of the University of South Carolina. And we're talking about a man named Richard T. Greener, who we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. He was a black man who was at one point the librarian at USC, was also a student and a professor at USC during the reconstruction period. And if you're thinking to yourself, wait, there were black people at USC during reconstruction? Yes, there were, we'll get to that in two weeks. But the gentleman asked me, so USC's library is named after him, right? Is named on Richard T. Greener. Richard T. Greener was a librarian. And I said, no, the library is named for Thomas C. Cooper. He asked me, who was that? Well, Thomas C. Cooper was a slave owner. He was also the second president of South Carolina College. And his ideas became very important to folks who believed in nullification. So of course, our library is named after Thomas C. Cooper and not Richard T. Greener. And there was an attempt a few years ago to name the library after Greener, which ultimately failed, but turned into the statue of Greener that is in front of the library today. Um, but again, we'll say more about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but as, as Brett has pointed out oftentimes, think about who these streets and buildings are named after. They tell an interesting story about who, for most of our state's history, were considered the leaders, movers, and shakers of South Carolina. But, Again, despite the paranoia I just mentioned, despite the strength of slavery and colony, despite the ever-present threat of slave revolt, there were still divisions amongst white South Carolinians as well. Now, that movement, let me go back a couple of pages for you. That movement into the upstate that we're talking about here in the 1760s wasn't easy. Think about this. This is the mid-18th century. Communication by letter, by mail, can take days, if not weeks, if not sometimes months, depending on who you're trying to communicate with. As more and more white South Carolinians and also the folks they own move further inland, they are finding that as they get further away from Charleston, there is less civil authority. There's less law and order. By 1767, in fact, things get so bad in the upstate that there are roving gangs of criminals basically going around robbing and killing people. And the government in Charleston has no response whatsoever to these issues. They simply don't have the people with which to enforce laws in the upstate. And so folks in the upstate take matters into their own hands and form what is known as the regulator movement. Now, this regulator movement is again really a, a, a descendant of the Goose Creek men in the sense that like the Goose Creek men two generations before them, the regulators are well-to-do people, but they are not the old money, say, of Charleston. They are instead folks who are farmers who just recently acquired slaves or want to acquire slaves, and they want to make a name for themselves in Carolina Colony. That's why they're all moving out of the low country. Low country by the mid 18th century is really full of, of older, well-established families. And the regulators are folks who are going further inland saying, let's make a name for ourselves away from those fools in the low country. Again, you're seeing the visions in the state between the low country and the rest of the state. This will define South Carolina for centuries to come. Now, I cannot help but note 
that one of the leaders of this movement is Patrick Calhoun, who was the father of someone who'd be a good friend of this class, John C. Calhoun. Now, I, I put this out not just because it's John C. Calhoun, but because it shows how in South Carolina's history, there are a lot of political leaders who come to prominence partly because of the family they're coming from. In the case of John C. Calhoun, he's not the first person in his family to become politically active or well-known in South Carolina. His father, Patrick, is one of the leaders of the regulator movement. We'll see this with other families as well, including the Hampton family. But the regulators are able to eventually get some semblance of law and order established in the upstate. And they're able to cut a deal with the government in Charleston to avoid any jail time. So when you're also thinking about the legacy of, say, vigilante justice or ideas of don't tread on me, for instance, those are, again, not just ideas that are slogans. These are also part and parcel of the state's history as well, of taking the law into your own hands, especially if you are a white South Carolinian. And again, um, what you're seeing is how the regulator movement shows how there is more and more movement into the upstate. Now, this is 1769. And by this point, the royal government has reorganized South Carolina into these districts. 96th district up here, Hammond district, Charles district, Georgetown district, Orangeburg district, Charlestown district, and Beaufort district. Uh, also, if you look at the map closely, notice there's not yet a Columbia, South Carolina. That comes next week. <laughs> But again, you can see here how the settlement of the upstate is still going pretty slowly, but it is proceeding apace. But that's why a lot of the folks in the regulator movement are moving upstate. They're trying to get away from the established old money of Charleston and the Low Country, which again is going to explain some of the conflict within the state um, in the years and generations to come. Now, how are they able to make this movement into the upstate, though? Well, again, as I mentioned before, uh, conflicts um, in Europe as well as North America um, eventually lead to the end of the French and Indian War and the Proclamation of 1763. Now, as Americans, when we learn about the Revolutionary War, uh, we tend to focus on the idea of taxation with a representation. And the idea that many American colonists felt they were being taxed not fairly. Um, however, remember why they're being taxed in the first place. And it is because the British government in London is concerned about defending the colonists from indigenous peoples. So the British have acquired all the territory you see here in sort of the pink color at the end of the French and Indian War in 1763. Many of the American colonists, including folks like George Washington, are deeply invested in land speculation in this newly acquired territory. In other words, they want to purchase the land and be able to sell it to make profit, uh, to make money off of colonists who want to move further inland. Again, the, the problem that you see in South Carolina of old money versus new settlers is happening all across 13 colonies. And many white American settlers want to move further west to basically leave behind competition with more entrenched economic interests. And especially in the South, it's all about leaving behind competition with enslaved labor. Only problem with this is the British government doesn't really care 
about what the settlers want. Because they know if the settlers keep moving west, further and further west, it's going to cause more conflicts with indigenous peoples. For example, in what is now Michigan, in 1763, there is what's called Pontiac's Uprising, where Chief Pontiac and his Native American allies fought the British military in the Midwest in 1763. The British, after this, realized that they're going to have to, A, keep a garrison in North America to defend against future Indian attacks, and B, they're also going to have to tell the colonists, okay, you guys have your colonies, you can move within them, but you cannot move past the Appalachian Mountains, the proclamation line of 1763. Unfortunately, as we all know from American history, moving west is as American as apple pie, and many settlers do not listen to the British government. At the same time, the British government is having to levy several taxes to pay for this garrison in North America, because after fighting all these wars in the 18th century, the British are just broke. They can't really afford to do this without raising new taxes. Now, the colonists from the 13 colonies are angered by these taxes. Uh, stamp, the Stamp Act, uh, the Tea Act, the Apollo Act, so many acts in the 1760s and 70s where the British are trying to pay for this garrison by taxing the colonists. The colonists, of course, argue that they do not have representation in London. Why are they being taxed for their own defense? And the British response is, you just answered your own question. You're paying for your own defense. But the colonists aren't having. And by 1773, what begins as a series of protests and riots in New England turns to protests throughout the 13 colonies, including a protest in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, the Charleston Tea Party is one of many events in the South during this time period gets glossed over. But what's funny about this is that Charleston Tea Party actually takes place about two weeks before the Boston Tea Party. Um, but the reason it gets glossed over is that where the Boston Tea Party, party was boisterous, where at some point it comes close to being a riot, the Charleston Tea Party was a bit more calm. It did involve dumping tea into the harbor of Charleston. It did involve protesting British authority and British taxation. But in typical genteel Charlestonian fashion, it wasn't quite over the top. But this does show that in South Carolina, you're seeing a building consensus against British authority and British rule. And it's going to be one of the underlying factors that causes the Revolutionary War. Now, between 1773 and 1775, many of the leaders in what becomes known as the Continental Congress, the assembly of leaders from across the 13 colonies, there is a hope that they can negotiate with Great Britain and avoid an all-out conflict. When the first Congress meets in 1774, no one there is talking about independence. They're simply talking about presenting a petition to Parliament, making their concerns known, and hoping that King George III and Parliament will negotiate in good faith. When the Second Continental Congress meets in May of 1775, however, they meet right after militia in New England clashed with British troops at Lexington and Concord. They are meeting just as the American army is about to face the British at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And throughout the spring and summer of 1775, more and more Americans begin talking about the I word, independence, that perhaps the time for negotiation has passed. Now, again, most Americans are not quite on board with this, but armed conflict between um, American militia and then the newly formed Continental Army and the British Army 
is making negotiations difficult to fathom. In the colony of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, the royal governor, is forced to take matters into his own hands even more. Now, Virginia is one of those colonies that is a definite hotbed of anti-parliament sentiment in 1775. In fact, it's so bad that Lord Dunmore, its royal governor, is forced to govern Virginia from a ship off its coast. It is on this ship in October 1775 that Lord Dunmore issues his proclamation. What, pray tell, was that proclamation about? Very simply, Lord Dunmore issues an order saying that any enslaved African who is owned by an American patriot who flees to British lines is free. In fact, Lord Dunmore adds, he'll do them one better. If you're an enslaved African male, not only will you have your freedom, but we'll give you a musket to fight against your former master as well. Now, I think it's pretty, pretty obvious that the American slave owners are not telling their slaves about this deal. <laughs> they aren't saying, by the way, you know, uh, this, this Dunmore fellow, he's going to give you your freedom if you want it. No. But the enslaved throughout history have a knack for learning things about which they should know nothing about. And this is a great example of that. Lord Dunmore's proclamation terrifies many Southern patriots because they realize that their war for independence could turn to a war that destroys the very institution upon which their financial wealth is based, slavery. As one British parliamentarian said, how is it that the loudest yelps of liberty come from the lips of slaveholders? <laughs> Ironic. Ironic indeed. But Dunmore's proclamation has a tremendous impact on the Revolutionary War. One so large, in fact, that historians are still arguing about it over 250 years later. Amongst other things, um, Lord Dunmore's proclamation puts into stark relief what the war means to the enslaved. While the British are promising the enslaved their freedom, around the same time, the new commanding officer of the Continental Army, George Washington, has ordered the army to not accept any black soldiers at all. Now, black men already fighting in militias out of New England can serve out the duration of the war, but the army itself will not actually recruit black soldiers, at least not for the first three years of the conflict. At the same time, in the Declaration of Independence, um, Thomas Jefferson writes the following about King George III. Quote, he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, I'll just the language here, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions, end quote. Now, what Jefferson is saying here is that King George III, who for most Americans becomes the chief villain in the War of Independence, is A, insisting on indigenous uh, peoples to attack the Americans, and B, he is trying to foment a slave revolt. Domestic insurrections, that is a reference to the enslaved and the threat of slave revolt throughout the colonies. Lord Dunmore's proclamation is really the South's biggest fear realized. Not only is there the potential for a slave revolt, but it could actually be backed by British force of arms. And in fact, as the war progresses, you will see thousands of black men serving under the British flag during the conflict. <laughs> now, in our traditional um, telling of the Revolutionary War, the American War of Independence, we tend to focus first on the early battles in the Northeast, uh, Lexington, Concord, Bunker Hill, the fall of 
New York in 1776, Saratoga in 1777. But there was fighting taking place in the South at that time as well. In fact, the Revolutionary War in the South is actually more like a civil war with patriots and loyalists alike, both being Americans in many cases, fighting each other in Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia. Also, indigenous tribes are heavily involved in the war. Many of those tribes, whether it's the Haudenosaunee in New York or the Cherokee in Georgia, they're having a difficult choice to make. Do we go with the devil we know, the British, or the devil we don't know, the Americans? In many cases, the indigenous tribes and kingdoms actually side with the British. Again, understanding that it was the British who put in place the proclamation line in 1763, and that it was American colonists who were constantly trying to break that line. Uh, the Cherokee, for example, uh, help out the British in South Carolina. And for their troubles, uh, they are defeated by the Patriots in battles and skirmishes throughout the upcountry in 1777 and 1778. But later on, the main theater of operations in the War of Independence would shift from the North to the South for several reasons. Number one, uh, the British are convinced that most white Southerners, even despite Lord the Moore's proclamation, are still loyal to the British crown. And they have some reason to believe that there are large numbers of British loyalists who were fighting for Great Britain in the South during the war. More importantly, however, the British are trying to end the war as quickly as possible. By 1778-79, France and Spain had both entered the war on the side of the Americans, primarily the weakened Great Britain's empire worldwide. So by 1780, the Revolutionary War is actually a world war. You have fighting in Gibraltar, you have fighting in India, you have fighting in the Caribbean. But the British are focusing their North American operations on the South, expecting an easy victory and expecting loyalists to rise up and to help them out. And early on, it looks like they might be right. 1778, Savannah falls to the British. By the way, that's an interesting battle because some of the soldiers who fight there are French soldiers. Some of those French soldiers are actually Haitians who were actually fighting alongside the Americans. Come back to that next week. The following year, Charleston also falls to the British. And with the fall of Charleston in 1780, the bulk of the American army in the South is basically wiped out. So, hooray, the war is over, right? The British win. They take Savannah, they take Charleston. We're done, right? Well, you know how I was saying earlier how the British are trying to win the war as quickly as possible? One of the funny things about the Revolutionary War is that if you look at the war, like divorce from the politics, divorce from everything else, the British actually do quite well. They were able to conquer most major American cities, Savannah, Charleston, New York, Philadelphia. But they can't control the countryside. Hmm. And imperial power <laughs> able to win most of the major battles, control most of the cities, but can't control the countryside and fails to win the hearts and minds of the civilians in their midst. Sounds kind of familiar. We'll come back to that. But the problem the British have in the South, especially in South Carolina is they did not take into account guerrilla warfare. Sure, the British are very adept at traditional 18th century warfare, but the tactics that the American patriots use in South Carolina perplex them. Um, if you've seen the film, The Patriot, you know <laughs> what I'm talking about. And funny enough, it was on earlier today and I almost turned to it, and then I realized I wanted to have a good day, and so I didn't turn to it. 
Actually, I like the movie for what it is, which is not historically accurate, but I think. But the film, the film does a good job in showing you what these tactics look like. Where, again, the main character in the movie is basically the Swamp Fox Francis Man. Mm -hmm. How they're using the swamp and the countryside to their advantage. The British troops are not used to fighting in these places. They're getting sniped at constantly um, in terms of fighting off small arms units and the like. It basically wears the British down. Um, a friend of mine in grad school at USC, in fact, wrote a dissertation about the Revolutionary War from the point of view of sleep deprivation. How the British soldiers, when they were faced with this kind of combat, literally could not sleep because they're constantly on the march, constantly on the move. And that has an impact on trying to fight the war. Now, Francis Marion and other guerrillas in South Carolina are able to basically force the British into battles they do not want to fight. The British supply, line, supply lines are stretched thin, they're overexposed. And eventually what happens is that they were able to buy time for the Americans to regroup and to create a new army in the South that will eventually drive the British North. So this is of course not a military history class, but I do wanna show you this map just to give you a sense of how the war ends the way it does. The British army in the South under Lord Cornwallis um, is eventually forced to retreat first out of South Carolina and they retreat in North Carolina and they actually are being forced basically my mouse will actually move, uh, up to Yorktown up here. Um, the idea for the British is that they're trying to link up with British units from the north that they think are moving down south to link up with them. And from there, their hope is to begin the war again in earnest and to defeat the American army in a decisive engagement. The problem that they did not anticipate happening is that for the one time in history, the French Navy is actually able to block the Royal Navy from assisting the British Army. And Yorktown turns into a siege where Lord Cornwallis is forced to surrender. With the British Army in the South collapsing, the British Parliament decides, okay, now is time for negotiation. Mainly because, as I mentioned before, they're fighting the, the French and the Spanish and the Dutch all over the world at this point. The British government is... is Isolated, politically speaking, they have no allies. Uh, the war in America has gone badly. Within Great Britain itself, there is a lot of dissent against the war. In Parliament, there is a move to basically cut funding for the war. And the defeat at Yorktown tells the British Prime Minister and King George III, it, that's it. Even if we wanted to try to win this war, we would have to expend so much more effort and troops that it could risk the destruction of the entire British Empire we will instead simply go ahead and lose 13 colonies and do our best to save the rest of the empire, which they actually do. But the revolution, it, it leaves North America in a state of absolute upheaval. For example, during the war, over 25 enslaved people in South Carolina alone flee to British lines during the war. Now let's put that into context. In 1775, out of a population of about 2.5 million Americans, half a million were enslaved. During the Revolutionary War itself, over 100,000 enslaved Africans flee from slavery. Whether it's to join the British, join the Americans, to become Maroons, or to simply fade off into history. Think about that. One out of every five enslaved Africans flees slavery during the Revolutionary War. This is the greatest upheaval in, in slavery in British North America slash the United States up to this time. It would be the biggest upheaval in slavery 
until the American Civil War 80 years later. But again, it's worth noting how in our popular imagining of the Revolutionary War, in terms of Black involvement in the war, we tend to think of Black patriots. Now, when I was a child growing up in Augusta, Georgia, one of the ways I learned Black history from my dad, from others in the community, was by learning about famous Black soldiers, Salem Poor, um, other Black men who fought in the Revolutionary War, and they were always Americans. Now, I've mentioned how George Washington banned the use of Black soldiers in the Continental Army. Well, a small thing called Valley Forge happens in 1777, 1778, when the American army nearly collapses during a winter stay in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. General Washington realizes they need soldiers. Anyone who can fight, they'll go ahead and enlist. And both free Blacks and enslaved Africans join the Continental Army. Now, the enslaved in particular are told several times, if you fight in the Continental Army, your freedom may be guaranteed. There are no promises. And this becomes an issue at the end of the war, when some enslaved Africans say, hey, I fought, I fought at Yorktown, I fought all other places, I'm free, right? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. It's unclear. This argument over freedom even extends to the, the Black men and women who flee to the British lines. Now, you know how in, in Revolutionary War discourse, we talk about the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, and the war doesn't actually end until 1783, right? In those two years, the Americans and the British are negotiating an end to the war. And one of the major sticking points is the fate of the formerly enslaved who fled to British line. The Americans insist that those enslaved Africans need to be sent back to their owners. And the British absolutely refuse to do so. The British instead insist that their honor depends on them guaranteeing these folks freedom and safety. They promise them their freedom and they will guarantee it to them. Like the one good thing the British do in history, but I, I, I'm kidding, just a joke. But many of these formerly enslaved Africans, they end up in, well, Sierra Leone for one, after the war is over, which becomes a colony of formerly enslaved Africans. Some move to Nova Scotia in Canada. Others move to Great Britain itself, live in London. And even a handful of these formerly enslaved folks from North America end up in a place called Australia by the end of the 1780s, being some of the first settlers of that land as well. Now, the Revolutionary War would produce a variety of leaders from South Carolina, amongst those Christopher Gadsden, who was a delegate to the Staff Act Congress and designs perhaps the most infamous flag now in the United States, the don't tread on me flag, mm -hmm. which, you know, the flag with the snake that says don't tread on me underneath it. Um, this is one of those things that if we taught the course, say like 20 years ago, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. <clears throat> but now the don't tread on me flag has become synonymous with the Tea Party, um, with the far right. Um, and again, this is an example of how flags and symbols can take on different meanings in different time periods. Now, the state itself um, becomes the first colony slash state to approve what's known as the Articles of Confederation, which was the first document to really bind the 13 colonies together, albeit during the Revolutionary War. This is the same year the first state constitution is also approved as well. And so what we're seeing is that as South Carolina moves from being a colony to a state, some of the issues that have plagued slavery, racism, uh, constant political turmoil, these are issues that are not gonna disappear 
but instead will become more and more intensified as we move from a British colony to an American state. All right, so I want to get to some questions this evening. Now there are, you know, the chat was kind of popping off while I was talking there. Um, and those are some great, some great things that Cecil Rigby has put um, in the chat. So please take a look at those. Um, I do see a question from, okay. This is a question from Tiaba Sadiq. This is a great question. Was subrogation used as a tool to stop working people from different ethnicities from organizing together again? And I believe this is actually a reference to uh, the Bacon's Rebellion I mentioned this sort of class this, this evening. Yes, um, in a sense, that's what they're trying to do. When they pass these various laws to connect slavery with racism and uh, slavery with race and skin color and the like, one of the things they're trying to do is to kill any sense of solidarity between people of European descent, people of African descent, aka white and black. This is, in fact, one of the recurring themes of the entire course. How throughout the history of South Carolina, the history of British North America, the history of the United States, there are these constant attempts, on the one hand, to create some sense of solidarity amongst different ethnic, ethnicities and racial groups. And on the other hand, there are attempts by the peoples in power to prevent such solidarity from happening. You're seeing it in the 17th century with John Punch, the Bacon's Rebellion. You see in the 18th century to an extent with the Stunnel Rebellion and the like. And we'll see plenty more examples of this in the classes to come. Okay. All right. Okay, so any other questions you can put in the chat or any questions from folks in the room with us this evening? Dr. Green, I wanted to yes. point out that I didn't make up the name Goose Creek man, um, <laughs> that there's actually a creek named Goose, and it's just above Charleston, um, and um, it's called Goose Creek. And so that was there when they came, and I'm not sure who named it Goose. <laughs> Go ahead, please. <laughs> um, I haven't really even phrased my question fully yet, but you mentioned that Georgia was a buffer between South Carolina and Florida. And yes. so the indigenous people actually moved west, like, like as people kept coming west, did they push west as well, or to like, as they like fought back, or did they just try to stand their ground where they at? in the buffer state or in the place where people were like moving here? That is a wonderful question. Um, and let me answer it like this in one. Let me first pull up a map. Okay, this is not. I'm not I, okay, I know a little later you talked about um, the British, that's why they were taxing because they were defending the colonists from indigenous people. Right. But over that entire time, like what was the movement of the indigenous people during all of this like movement? So that, I could answer that in two ways. Number one, in a general sense, the indigenous peoples are being pushed further and further westward mm -hmm. to an extent. But it's also worth noting that when you see maps like this, well, let me go back. When you see maps like this, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes very easy to see the map as the Europeans live in the colonies here and the Indian Reserve is here. Uh -huh. When in fact, the many of these colonies, you still have indigenous peoples living within those borders because the indigenous might surprise many of us are not at these treaty negotiations. Mm -hmm. They don't really recognize most of these, these claims, but they're kind of forced to at, at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. But with your question, right, especially in Georgia, the Cherokee Nation is going to be in Georgia up until the 1830s and 40s. And We'll talk about this some next week, but it's a good time to talk about it now. The various indigenous tribes in the South are faced with some really perplexing dilemmas, especially after the British leave. For one, some of them, like the Cherokee, they try to embrace European dress, uh, European culture, et cetera, in an attempt to show that they can live within the borders of Georgia and be left alone. The Cherokee, for example, create a written language 
they create a newspaper, all of this to show that, no, we can be as civilized as you are. It doesn't work because people, the white citizens of Georgia, discover gold deposits in Cherokee Nation lands and want that land. And Cherokee are forced to go westward. In other parts of the South, the Carolinas, for example, the indigenous tribes, the Yamasee are destroyed, the Catawba are, they're kind of left alone, but they're a very small tribe. Other tribes um, are often forced to go westward, but this is a gradual process. I don't want to make it seem as though, like our guest said last week, the indigenous just disappear. Instead, they are trying to navigate a very difficult situation. And part of the difficulty, by the way, is that when the new United States forms, white Americans are not united on the subject of division speakers. Some, like, for example, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they're saying what we should do is if we give the indigenous people time, they will become like us. They will purchase land. They will embrace European civilization. They could, even down the road, perhaps become American citizens, or at the very least, some people we can negotiate with and tolerate in our midst. Many other Americans do not agree with that assessment, though, and they want indigenous land. And so this is, make a, a, a short answer to your very good question. What's going to end up happening is that most of these indigenous peoples are going to be forced to either move west or some actually move into Florida. Um, we have the example of the Seminole tribe, for example, who fights off the U.S. Army for decades in the, 18, in the 19th century. But again, for the most part, it is either you're displaced or you're destroyed. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. And the Maroons. Okay. Now, the Maroons, I'm going to talk more about them next week, but I'm going to bring it up now because they're actually really important. So I mentioned the Maroons in passing last week, but in case you don't know what a Maroon is, Maroons were formerly enslaved Africans who would flee into swamps or forests, areas that were not easy to navigate, and just stay there. When we, when we think of the enslaved fleeing to freedom, in an American context, we think of the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. of going north. For a lot of enslaved folks, that wasn't the best option. Some of them would simply stay in areas that were difficult to, to navigate. For example, in South Carolina, there are Maroons who, are, who will live out in Congaree Swamp for years, sometimes decades. Or in North Carolina and Virginia, the Great Dismal Swamp. They'll just live there and just stay there. In the British colony of Jamaica, you have a large Maroon population, so large, in fact, the British have to negotiate with them. And of course, you have the Maroon population in San Domingue, Haiti, that becomes powerful in its own right. You have maroon populations in Brazil, uh, in Cuba. In essence, the idea here is that the concept of freedom doesn't look the same for every enslaved person. Every enslaved person wants to be free. But what that freedom looks like depends on where you are and the context in which you're living. For some, it means if I can make it from South Carolina to Pennsylvania, I'll take my chance. For others, it says, I'm living in um, Lower Richland. I'm going to flee the Congaree Swamp and just stay there and take my chances that way. Mm -hmm. And in fact, next week, when we talk about Denmark VC's rebellion, we'll also talk about a maroon named Joe, who's around at the same time and is causing arguably more panic than Denmark VC was. But that is a story for next week. Mm -hmm. I bring up the Maroons because they're the, a lot of the the, the uh, communities in the swamps, most were in the swamps, were also indig uh, indigenous people. Mm -hmm. I was involved in 1969 with a freedom school in Ridgeville, and that community of natives went to the Fort Worth swamp and stayed there until people quit killing Indians, and uh, you know they were there for a long time, but they're still there, mm -hmm. and they now have tribal recognition. Mm -hmm. And that's between here and Charleston. Okay, any other questions? Yes. 
Were enslaved indigenous people given the same offer by the British? That's a good question. I will have to look into that. Um, and I, I think part of why I look, look into that is by the 1770s, I don't think there were very many indigenous enslaved people left. Um, but I'll look into that. I'll have an answer for you next week. I, I would assume the, I think the answer might be yes, but I'll check into that just to be absolutely sure. Oh, okay. I see there's actually a question on Zoom. Go ahead, please. It's still left top. Yes, there you go. Okay, good evening, everyone. I just have a question for a point of clarification. I'm in the reading where it spoke to the Constitutional Convention, the five delegates from the Low Country, there was Pierce Butler, Charles Pickney, Charles Cotsworth Pickney, and John Rutledge. Charles Pickney and Charles Cotworth Pickney, are those two one and the same? And then there was only four, but above the line it said it was five. Is there something missing or am I missing something? Well, two things about that. I'll talk about those gentlemen next week, but they're from the same family. Okay. It's just one is, that's why it's Charles Pickney and Charles Cotsworth Pickney. They're two different men, but they're from, uh, they're from the same family. Um, I think I think the problem is I think there's actually a name missing there because it was five delegates. Um, but let me, while I try to get that answer to your question, there was a question here as well. Go ahead, please. But just uh, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned that when when uh, Spain was offering enslaved peoples um, a measure of liberty, there were some conditions, and one of them was to convert to Catholicism. It made me wonder uh, what roles religion played in oppression and or resistance uh, during this colonial period? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, so let me get an answer for you. I want to show you something I meant to show earlier and just forgot about it. Mm -hmm. uh, what I am about to show you are the, the this is the, the, uh, the documents of the founding of Carolina Colony in March 1669, right? Um, and I meant to show this earlier, just forgot about it, but the way slavery is mentioned um, actually comes back to your question, because what they say here, they have like over a hundred plus rules and laws in the document. Um, 110, and let me see if I can just blow this up for everybody here, okay. 109, no person whatsoever shall disturb, molest, or persecute another for his speculative opinions in religion or his way of worship. So in theory, Carolina will be free to anybody related to religion. But then you go to 110. Every freeman of Carolina shall have absolute power and authority over his Negro slaves of what opinion and religion soever. So what you're seeing in Carolina colonies, colonies at this time, is that we shift from, as I mentioned last week, the enslaved Africans are targeted partly because they are not Christian. The idea is that they're Muslim or practicing an indigenous faith in Africa, they are fair game for slavery. But in the 17th and especially 18th centuries, you're seeing more and more Europeans arguing, well, if we convert them to, say, Protestant Christianity, we can create a kind of social control over them that will keep them in line, um, to keep them fully ensconced in our system of religion and culture, et cetera, to reduce the potential risk of rebellion. Now, of course, we know that's not how it actually works, that the enslaved themselves are able to hear about the stories of Moses, the promised land, et cetera, and to use that for inspiration in slave revolts and the like. But you're absolutely right. Religion plays a critical role for both the English and the Spanish in terms of controlling people, in terms of building up these systems of slavery. Thank you. Okay. Cecil answered the question, Edward, Edward Rutledge. Uh, okay, Edward Rutledge, okay. <laughs> we'll always leave out Edward Rutledge. And Keith, Keith said he couldn't understand Brett with one Keith's question, and you answered it, but I think that part of the answer is that religion was the hypocrisy that helped push the Colonization. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely. 
Any other uh, questions? This is a random question, but I always think of the don't tread on me flag and I'll be in discussion because it is associated with far right people. But what was the original design meant to mean when it was when it came out? Yeah, that's what, a, this, this, what is the snake and the uh, like I just I've looked into this in the past, but I forgot just out of discussion probably. So the, the, <laughs> so actually the don't tread on me flag was inspired by this cartoon. Oh. Let me just show it to you real quick. And you know what's sad is I did a, a search for it on my computer and all it had is like tea party stuff and everything. But yeah, no, that's something. a lot. I don't know. But it actually relates to this. Pull it up real quick. Now, the old tread on me image comes from this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a cartoon that was created by, amongst others, Benjamin Franklin in the 1750s. And the idea, you see the Bible says join or die. Mm -hmm. The idea was that the colonies had to stick together in the face of initially actually fighting the French and Indian War and later on against the British government. But the idea behind the snake was the snake is more powerful, linked together, united, and that transformed into the don't tread on me flag the revolutionary era, basically making the snake sort of image, an image of not being trampled on of resistance. So you have a random question, I have a random answer. Okay, and, and Cecil asked the question, is South Carolina the tail for a specific reason? Um, you know, I'll be honest, I don't know. I would just assume, and here's why, my assumption is, and you know what's an assumption, makes an answer to you and me, but my assumption here is the reason where the tail is that if you look at this map and look at this image, there's no Georgia, right? So like Georgia by this point was like a recently formed colony. And if you look at it, it really goes from North to South, New England, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. So I don't think there's any other reason <laughs> why we are the tail of the snake besides we were the southernmost colony in this association of colleges. Is it is it chronological? Um, no. well, if it, it were chronological, you would actually have Virginia before New England. I see. In terms of foundation. Sure. Um, I'm thinking it's just going like north to south. Absolutely. Um, that makes sense. Although you know, I, will, I will not make the joke about New England being like the, the head of the snake, but <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go there. Mm -hmm. I have some friends who are in New England, so I will, I will leave them alone. And it makes sense in terms of the autonomy as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely true. Any other questions? I'm wearing an Adidas track suit. I'm ready for anything. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so Georgia was created as a uh, buffer. Yeah. Um, we also know, so, okay, it was created as a buffer. We also know that it uh, was also with South Carolina proponent of slavery. Actually, Georgia, when it was first found, it was meant to be free of slaves. Oh, okay. And then that changed within like two years. <laughs> well, so, okay, that, that's part of the question that I have. <laughs> Who would move there knowing that you're just meant to be space between an enemy and a friend? No, that is a that is a great question, and I would answer it by going back to what I mentioned about the regulators, right? If you're someone who is interested in settling in North America at that time period, you're likely someone who is willing to take a chance to make some money. So with Georgia, for example, as a colony, I mentioned before when it was founded, the idea that James Oglethorpe had was this will be a colony. It will be a buffer between South Carolina and Florida, yes. But it will also be a colony free of slavery. We will make sure this colony has no slaves at all. It will prove that an economy free of slavery can work in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Folks moved there and they said, this soil is very fertile, very useful. We should bring in some slaves. And Oglethorpe just threw his hands up in disgust and said, okay, fine, whatever. Um, but again, this is getting back to this idea of economic competition amongst white settlers, that they're willing to move anywhere if they can avoid competition. And funny enough, with other slaveholders at first, 
-hmm. and then eventually with each other as well. So it's really more of a question of, I'm going to move to a place where I can get some cheap land and hopefully get some cheap labor as well. Cool. That's actually, to kind of zoom out from the Carolinas and Georgia for a second, that is also in many ways the defining characteristic of much of early American history, which is white American settlers are often moving westward or moving somewhere else because of economic competition, oftentimes with folks who own slaves. For example, I mentioned the New York slave revolt in 1712 and 1740. The later one in 1740 is more a slave conspiracy. But there were rumors that the enslaved might rise up. The rumors were caused by the fact that in New York City in 1740, there was a devastating recession going on. And the recession was being blamed on slaveholders. And the fact that many white New Yorkers couldn't find work because they were in competition with enslaved labor. This is also going to be a defining characteristic of American politics in the mid 19th century as well, which we'll get to next week, where many white Northerners are not friends of Black people at all, but they despise slavery because of its threat as an economic system. So, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay, I see. Okay. You and then I'll get back to the chat. Go ahead, please. Um, so like then who are like their biggest customers for these plantation owners? You know, like who's then like buying all the produce that they're making or the production that the slave owners and slaves are making? I will do one better than tell you the question, though. I will show you. So her question was who are the customers for the products or the produce and the other goods that the enslaved are are cultivating and such? And let me show you what who their customers actually are. Hmm. Ah, this is okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, now I want to make it because I want to, I, I don't want to tell you, I want to actually show you what I'm talking about here. As you can tell, I love maps. And I think this map explains your question quite well. So, you have to remember that slavery as a system is part of a larger economic system. Yesterday, Dr. Justine Hill Edwards talked about how uh, slavery was very much tied to capitalism. And amongst historians, right, even today for the last like 60 years, so we've been arguing about was, sla was slavery part of capitalism? Was capitalism a post-slavery system? Did slavery and capitalism just coexist and so on and so forth? Some historians argue that the history of capitalism begins with the slave trade because of maps like this, where you have the enslaved being brought from West Africa to South America, West Indies, North America, et cetera. But the goods the enslaved are cultivating, right? Sugarcane, San Domain, rice and indigo in South Carolina, later on cotton. North America. Also, a, a, a ton of other products. For example, in South America, the enslaved are being used to do everything from mining silver to diving to the ocean for pearls. Throughout the West Indies, the Caribbean, they're being used for a wide range of crops as well. So to answer your question, the customers are all over the Atlantic world, in the Americas, uh, in Europe, and you can argue even in Africa, because what the African Africans are receiving in exchange for selling enslaved peoples are finished products from Europe, like clothes, muskets, um, other weapons, other products like that. So again, this is the most slavery. It, it, I think when we think about slavery in American context, we, we tend to understandably focus on the racism behind it. But we should always remember that the racism of slavery and the slave system is tied to the economic strength of that system. That as abolitionists will argue in the 19th century, what they'll say is every American is tied to slavery in some form or fashion. Even New Englanders, we can claim we hate slavery, we can claim we are opposed to slavery, and then we go out and we buy goods made from cotton cultivated in the deep south. Which is why, for example, a lot of us today don't want to look too closely at the tags on our clothes. 
to think about where they're from <laughs> or the phones that we have or the watches that we wear. But as always say, I digress. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so there were a couple of questions. Okay, so Sandy, you've had your hand up for some time now. Please go ahead with your question. I'll get to Kim's question in chat. Um, Sandy, please unmute yourself. Uh oh. Try again, Sandy. Okay. There we go. Now we can hear you. Okay. Uh, my my question was uh, possibly you answered it, but I was uh, trying to backtrack into your lecture and talking about uh, <clears throat> during the time of 1777 and 1778, when there were a lot of Cherokee Indians that joined with the British to fight. I was also trying to understand knowing that they were already inhabitants of North America, what kind of bargain did they get, did the British offer them, you know, as becoming part of, of the war? Because, you know, we talked about how the, um, they said any uh, slaves that could transfer out of South Carolina into the British colonies, they would automatically be free. So. That was my primary question. So you're asking about the Cherokee, right? Yes, sir. Okay. No, that, that's a wonderful question. The, the thing is, is that the Cherokee, like so many other indigenous tribes, they understand that they really cannot trust the British. They know that. But they also know that they can trust the Americans even less because it's the Americans who've been trying to move into their land since 1763. What the Cherokee are hoping is that if they can either stay out of the war or fight alongside the British, it will ensure their safety after the war is over. One thing to keep in mind is that the British are assuming, or rather the Cherokee are assuming that the British are going to win. So you kind of want to be on the side of the folks who are going to win to you know, have a stronger hand in a post-war settlement. Um, but also the Cherokee just do not trust the Americans. They don't have any reason to because this is a new government. This is a new nation. They have nothing to base any idea of trust off of, um, even if the other option is the British. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, and Kim had a question in the chat. Were early enslaved Africans still identifying themselves tribally? And for how long? You know, that's a good question. To some extent, they, they are, but what's happening in the America, whether you talk about the seasoning process when they come to the Caribbean before going to the mainland or on the mainland itself, is that their identity is becoming subsumed under the practice of slavery. So even if they try to keep their tribal identifications going, they're being thrown into to groups of other tribes and women. They're being thrown into situations where they're talking to folks from all over West Africa. The Europeans are intensely trying to destroy that identity system. Dr. Goldman, please chime in. I just actually wanted to give a reference, but that specific question is a subject that uh, Dr. Jacob Carruthers uh deals with among others in his book um uh african or american a question of intellectual allegiance uh so i think uh and and there's another book let me find that uh let's see uh, Uh, it's called, um, oh goodness, uh, Intellectual Warfare by Dr. Jacob H. Carruthers. Um, he has a whole chapter that answers that question for you. And 
one of his um, associates, Dr. Anderson Thompson, uh, used to pose the question in a lecture that he gave, um, when, what did the, when did the Africans who were kidnapped here want to start being an American? Uh, when did that process occur? And he gets uh, very deeply into that. And I think that's reflected in, in, in Dr. Carruthers' book. So I, th I would recommend that as a reference for, uh, for that particular question, because it's, it's a very interesting question and it's very, very philosophical. Definitely, definitely. And I think um, I put a link to the Intellectual Warfare book um, in the chat. Um, and I also the, the, the author and try to put in the chat as well. Um, and Cecil has a question. Isn't it true that parts of the slave acts prohibited the indentured speaking of native languages? They couldn't sing their imported cultural song, et cetera. That, that is also correct. Um, do you see attempts through the creation of these laws to not only control the bodies of the slave, but also their minds as well, by trying to break up certain cultural practices and the like. Um, and that is occurring with all these various acts too. Dr. Graves, we're running out of questions. I want to point out that uh, this coming Sunday, uh, there are two deeper dives, uh, and the one at four, four to six is our normal time, and those Sunday afternoon events are open to the public beyond the students, but they're relevant to the students, we encourage you to come. And at four, next Sunday, we're going to have um, Chris Judge, who's the uh, Associate Director of the University of South Carolina Center for Native American Studies, with uh, a guest who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the South Carolina uh, Native American Affairs Commission, which is commission, which is a um, a five hundred one c three with uh, eight state tribes and one federal tribe that have been around since the seventies as a collective unit that would have been participating with us for a long time now. And then at six thirty is Dr. Green's first uh, lecture on ancient Africa. Dr. Gallman's. Dr. Gallman's. What did I say? Dr. Green. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dr. Gallman, who you just heard speak, Dr. Gallman is a, a physician here in uh, in Columbia who has, for the last 40 years, been doing presentations on ancient Africa going back to the time of the library in Alexandria and much of the, you know, the wisdom of the Greeks coming from Egypt and picking up and reminding people that the people that were enslaved had a rich history before they were brought here, uh, unlike what some people want you to believe that they were lucky to be brought here in chains so they could get a good job. <laughs> so that Dr. Green's first, Dr. Green, Dr. Gallman's first lecture starts at 6 30 to 8 o'clock, and there'll be 10, uh, there's 10 lectures. This this Sunday's the first, and those uh, links to that will go out tomorrow. And again, if you look at uh, class one, it also has a description of both these deeper dives as well on next Sunday. So again, take a look at those. Uh, Again, think about what you're getting here. Right? You're getting a class and deeper dives. You're getting two deeper dives this Sunday. So there's plenty, plenty to choose from, plenty to learn from as well. And those the deeper dives are open to the public. So feel free to to bring others with you who are not enrolled in the course. Okay. All right. So I think this is um. Yeah, I think this is a good time for us to go ahead and in wrap scene. everything up. Oh, as in scene. Oh, and, and I want to tell the people in Zoom land up there, I apologize we walked off and left y'all and we partied right in front of you and then turned you <laughs> off. We won't do that again. I'm going to stay around. I'm going to go hide in the kitchen, keep my computer on. And if any of you got any questions or criticisms, I want to hear it and we can Zoom a little while. We did this when we were only Zooming during the pandemic and we kept the class open. So you get to meet each other and open the microphone and talk with each other so you don't miss this wonderful conviviality we have here. And I think, Becky, memory serves, someone's also setting up a chat for folks to talk between classes, is that right? Yeah, if you could um, let Josh say a few words about what he set up, thank you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, everybody, so really simple, it's just a group meeting 
just an opportunity for us to chat outside of class, also ask questions of each other so we don't have to overwhelm Becky and, and Brent with questions, et cetera, et cetera, uh, like logistical questions. Um, most of y'all are already on it in the room. For y'all in Zoom, I don't know where I want to. Oh, come over here. Come over here. <laughs> All right, for y'all in Zoom land, um, I'm just going to have Becky send out a link, and that makes it really, really easy, along with some instructions for downloading GroupMe. should be very, very simple, though. shouldn't be very difficult. And I'll also include my email address on there. So if you do have questions, if you're having trouble setting it up, you can bug me about it. And I think that's about it. All right, excellent, Josh. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm also this week going to send out my latest book recommendations. I have two. Um, one is called Calling Out Liberty, The Stono Slave Rebellion and the Universal Struggle for Human Rights by Jack Schuler. It was all about Stono Rebellion. And the second one is titled The Common Win, Afro-American Currents in the Age of the Haitian Revolution by Julius Scott. This is a bit more relevant for next week because we will discuss the Haitian Revolution next week as well. Uh, but both books get at the idea of thinking about the enslaved as having minds of their own, of having communication of their own, of being able to discuss and talk about ideas of freedom in ways that were just as sophisticated and thorough as their European counterparts. Because for them, freedom was not just a concept, it was something to literally die for. All right. So now I think we're going to sing. Yes, we are. Yeah, so um, the people in the mood in the room have music. I just posted the lyrics to the chat. Um, those of you who are here for the um, orientation, we did this. Um, uh, so um, we're going to sing as a group here in the Grove Building. Um, if you're online, um, we encourage you to sing along with us. However, you need to remain mute. Um, if otherwise, we'll have issues with audio delay and it'll just be a a cluster of a wanted this um so um so yeah i'll i'll sing first and then um feel free to join in and, and sing along mm -hmm. come on you can't sing in the pews no you can't stand up. Oh, you can't sing, sing. yeah yeah stand up <laughs> we have come to the bar we won't turn around We'll flood the streets with justice. We are freedom now. We have come too far. We won't turn round. We'll flood the streets with justice. We are freedom now. Good, thank you. And so um, we're going to, I don't know if we'll do it every class, but we are going to try and do this throughout the semester. Um, and then once we get more comfortable with the song, we'll kind of do some fun stuff with, with rounds and breaking into groups and stuff like that. Thank you so much. No, please practice. That was sung like a bunch of white people. <laughs> Y'all gonna have to find a way to stop excluding the folks on Zoom because we have come too far. Yes, we have. Turn around. Why'd she we'll say it? The streets with justice. Yeah, we man. Freedom bound. <laughs> if anybody on the Zoom thing wants to stay and talk with these people here, they're gonna go away. I'm going to go hide in the kitchen, and Becky, I'm sure, will stay with us for a little while. Let's take a five-minute break to go bust your nose or something, and we'll come back in five minutes. Michelle, Thanks, Michelle. I'm going to appoint you, I'm going to appoint you director of the um, Jessica Simpkins uh, Memorial Zoom Choir. Absolutely. I'm going to show up for AD. I love y'all.